It's said there's no replacement for displacement, but in actuality, there is. It's called boost. It's the great problem solver for the internal combustion engine's biggest weakness. It's dependency on air density to make power. In the mountains and higher altitudes where the air is less dense, a naturally aspirated engine will suffer immensely from the lack of oxygen, and to maintain a proper air-fuel ratio, the fueling will need to be decreased, robbing it of power. The fix for this is utilizing a turbocharger or supercharger, which artificially creates denser air to feed the engine, and combined with more fuel restores the power loss at higher altitudes, and becomes even more powerful when you use it back at sea level. The implementation of either style has its drawbacks, though. Turbochargers, which use exhaust pressure and heat to spool a turbine attached to a compressor, have rotational inertia, so there's a time delay or lag with rapid throttle changes. Superchargers, which are these crankshaft-driven apparatuses, have an arguably even worse side effect, parasitic loss. Since the supercharger is connected directly to the crankshaft, the rotational force used to compress the air will detract from some of the increased output the supercharger provides. If only there was a way to eliminate the lag of a large turbocharger and negate the effects of parasitic loss from superchargers. Well, in the 1980s, the Italian engineers at Lancia and Abarth would solve the age-old dilemma by combining these two force induction philosophies and create a monster that would subsequently be banned from competing in FIA-sanctioned racing events. <laughs> It could produce four digits of horsepower at an astounding five bar of boost while only being 1.8 liters in displacement and only using four cylinders. And it was the most advanced engine in the world for its time, more advanced than any Ferrari, Lamborghini, or Porsche offering up to that point. It was the ethos of the 1980s Group B era, where if you weren't innovative, batshit crazy, and cheating in that order, you weren't going to win races. This is the story of twin charging, an idea as old as the internal combustion engine itself, perfected in Italy, proven in the crucible of Group B rallying, and forbidden as a technique that even the bravest and deep-pocketed individuals not dare attempt. Welcome to Explained. Nineteen eighty-two. This marks the beginning of an era in the World Rally Championship that would push the envelope in regards to engineering, speed, power, and ultimately safety. The FIA's Appendix J, which detailed production-based car regulations, was restructured to form groups A, B, C, and N, which replaced the previous groups 1 through 6. While Group N and Group A cars required 5,000 road legal units to qualify or to be homologated, Group B, however, only required 200 units to be homologated, which made Group B more accessible to small manufacturers, and the minimal restrictions in the drivetrain and chassis design made it the perfect testbed for unconventional drivetrains. While rear-wheel drive was a preferred method of putting the power down because of simplicity and reliability, Audi's revolutionary Quattro all-wheel drive system, which initially was seen to be slower with its poor weight distribution and reliability, was quickly closing the gap forcing manufacturers like Lancia to go back to the drawing board to develop an all-wheel drive rally car of their own. Even after winning the manufacturer's title in 1983 with the 037, Lancia and Abarth would begin development of a new power plant that would improve on the 037 supercharged inline four. The engine's displacement was very important not only for power but for clash structure, since Group B applied a 1.4x equivalency factor to force induction engines to keep the playing field somewhat fair for naturally aspirated engines. The higher the calculated displacement, the higher the minimum weight required to race, which really emphasized the need for small displacement turbocharged engines if they wanted to be lightweight and agile. The issue quickly arose that to reach the 400 horsepower goal to be competitive against Audi and Peugeot's all-wheel drive beasts, it would take a relatively large turbocharger which introduced turbo lag which in rally racing that requires constant modulation of throttle inputs to control the car, lag can be very frustrating, unforgiving, and even deadly. Abarth's solution was simple in theory but complicated in production. 
It would use the Volumex supercharger from the 037 to prime the turbocharger and build boost at low RPMs, and then the turbocharger would take over, carrying the power to high RPMs where the supercharger was less efficient. The collaboration resulted in the 233 ATR-18S, the first production twin-charged engine. It produced 450 horsepower at 8,000 RPM, which was an impressive 250 horsepower per liter. The engine was actually developed before the chassis, and with the 1.4x displacement multiplier, it would put it in the upper range of the 2000 to 2500 cc class, and the chassis could weigh as low as 890 kilograms. Abarth would develop a space frame mid-engine tube chassis evolved from the 037, but with the help of an English company Hewlin for the all-wheel drive system, featuring a viscous coupling center differential that allowed a 75-25 rear front torque split and used Lancia's mass-produced Delta HF as a silhouette made in carbon Kevlar composite. Previously codenamed SC038, this new Group B monster was called the Delta S4 the S for supercharge and 4 indicating four-wheel drive. In its debut in late 1985, it would place first at the English RSE rally driven by a young charismatic Henry Toivonen and then repeated this feat at the 1986 Monte Carlo rally, putting a stop to Peugeot's year-long dominance in Group D. Despite reports of the chassis being fragile on tougher terrain, the drivetrain was proven reliable even with the added complication of two forced induction systems and a new bespoke all-wheel drive system. The Delta S4 was destined for a manufacturer's win in 1986, but during the French Tour de Corsica rally, Henry Toivonen and co-driver Sergio Cresto would take a left-hand corner too fast and tumble down a rocky embankment into some trees. The extensive weight reduction and no skid plates exposed the fuel tank to be punctured by the tree branches, ultimately having the Delta S4 go up in flames, consuming Toivonen and Cresto. This crash, along with an incident during the Portugal rally where three spectators were fatally wounded when Hakim Santos lost control of his Ford RS200, really sealed the deal for FIA President Jean-Marie Bellestier to abolish Group B at the end of 1986. While the Delta S4 was banned in rally, it would find privateer groups using it for hill climb events, cranking the boost of the 1.8 liter engine to 5 bar and making 1,000 horsepower in testing. The concept of twin charging wouldn't die with the Delta S4. The road-going homologation cars, the S4 Stradales, would get the same 233 ATR-18S engines from the Group B cars, just detuned to 250 horsepower from a smaller turbocharger and tuned to run on pump gas and not the toluene lace racing fuel used in Group B. The twin charging philosophy would also be adopted by an unlikely candidate, Nissan. In 1987, Nissan would launch an homologation special, the March Super Turbo, which were compact front-wheel drive economy cars that used a supercharger and turbocharger in series to mitigate the effects of turbo lag on its 930cc inline four-cylinder. The supercharger provided 0.7 bar of boost up to 4,000 RPM, where it would electromagnetically declutch, and the turbo would take over and raise boost up to one bar all the way to 6,500 RPM. The tiny 930cc MA09 ERT engine produced 108 horsepower and could propel the March Super Turbo to 100 kilometers an hour below 8 seconds, which was very respectable for a late 80s compact car. While not having huge success in Group A rally, the homologation cars were a true twin-charge production car, unlike the Delta S4 Stradale's small batch of cars. By the early 90s, the twin-charge torch would fizzle out, mainly due to the rapid advancement in turbocharger design and control systems. When the driver lift off the pedal, the ECU would delay ignition around 40 degrees of timing and rich in the fuel mixture so it would ignite after top dead center as the exhaust valve opened, carrying that intense heat and pressure through the exhaust manifold directly to the turbo. 
In Toyota's case, brass tubes fed air from the turbocharger compressor directly into the exhaust runners, adding even more oxygen to the fire. While this created tons of heat on the turbocharger, a spectacle of flames out the exhaust, it more importantly primed the turbocharger to light off with the next throttle input. Twin charging would become a more costly alternative to a couple brass tubes and lines of code in an ECU. Twin charge engines extreme rarity and lack of proliferation is based on two truths that will always remain. Adding a supercharger to an already turbocharged engine and vice versa will add another possible failure point from a reliability standpoint as seen on the street version of the Delta S4, the Stradales. Secondly, it doesn't make more power since the added supercharger is only beneficial below 4,000 RPM and a modern turbocharger with variable geometry and twin scroll housings will be able to spool a turbocharger as low as 1,800 RPM and sustain boost to redline with advanced controls in the ECU. Twin charging wasn't a relatively revolutionary technology, but it was the bridge between the laggy turbos of the 70s and 80s and the powerful ECUs and anti-lag systems of the 90s. We appreciate the days before fancy coding and electronics, where to solve the issue of turbo lag, you strap a supercharger to the engine and made a car so raw, so potent, it would define the essence of Group B entirely.